Hi everyone, in today's video we are going to be talking about pathfinding and in particular I'm going to show you how to implement pathfinding um, with a game that we probably all know of from C211, uh, Tower of Hanoi. Um, so pathfinding in general I know is a concept that you guys have covered a little bit in lecture but I just want to revisit it um, one more time for clarity's sake. Uh, so pathfinding is just the general concept of traversing a graph in a way um, to efficiently move from one point in the graph to another point in the graph or find a path between um, one node and another node. And there's obviously a lot of different ways to do it. You know, the, the most trivial way would be doing some sort of brute force algorithm. Um, but uh, in AI, when we work with these larger graphs, these decision graphs, um, these game graphs, uh, we want to approach the problem in a more sophisticated manner, and that's given rise to a, kind of a whole classification of algorithms that we call the pathfinding algorithms. Um, there are so many pathfinding algorithms um, that it'd be impossible to discuss throughout the course or throughout the um, throughout the term of this course. However, we are going to introduce um, some of the, the general pathfinding um, algorithms that you'll come to see and um, hopefully become familiar enough that you can implement them with ease. Uh, so without further ado, um, let me introduce kind of the motivation for this particular project, um, and that is solving this, this Tower of Hanoi puzzle. Um, from 211, you probably remember that the uh, objective is to move all the disks from one peg to another peg. Um, but it, the important invariant is that a, um, we can never let a larger disk ever sit upon a smaller disk. Um, for the full instructions, I've included a link here. Um, additionally, there's a demonstration um, in case you want a visual representation of what solving Tower of Hanoi looks like. Um, I know in 211 you guys went over the recursive solution. Um, but the recursive solution is kind of limited, right? It, it can only work if you know what the starting state is and it's, you know, the starting state looks something like this. Um, but what if we had kind of a random configuration of disks on pegs and we didn't really know what our starting state was um, and we had to get to some arbitrary ending point um, that maybe wasn't necessarily having all of the disks on another peg. Um, so to give you kind of a visual of that, um, here's kind of the connection, um, the, the graph for what a, um, for, or the game graph for what the um, Tower of Hanoi looks like. Each one of these represents a particular configuration of disks um, on, on pegs and, and how they're all connected like this. Um, so the traditional Tower of Hanoi is moving from, you know, one um, configuration where they're all on, you know, one peg, let's say peg A, to having them all on another peg, let's say peg C, um, and you kind of want to move along this edge of the game graph here. But for example, you know, we could just as easily want to move from, you know, this configuration here to this configuration down there, and that's a much more general problem that you can't solve um, easily with, with any sort of just uh, recursion algorithm that you guys have learned previously. And so our objective is to, um, without kind of foreknowledge of this game graph, find the shortest path between two arbitrary points um, in, in the game graph. So you guys have probably talked a little bit about some of the different pathfinding algorithms that you, know, you, you can apply um, and the different uh, trade-offs amongst all of them. Um, but in this course, uh, all of them can be kind of reduced to this, this general pathfinding algorithm. Um, now, I'm not going to go through kind of the proof of this, because I'm sure you guys have either talked about it in, um, in, in class or um, it's been referenced in the textbook, um, but I do want to go over kind of like the algorithmic step-by-step, -step, here's, here's what it looks like. Um, so step one is you need to load up your initial data container um, with the start state. So this is, for example, if we go back to Tower of Hanoi, this might be your start state. So however you want to represent this in you know, computer memory, um, you want to load that into your initial data container. And then you've got this kind of while loop that drives the search algorithm. So while this data container is not empty, we want to remove the next element. If it's the goal state, then we've, we've, we've um, found a path. So we can terminate, um, and then we're going to unwind this parent-successor relationship tracker, which I'll talk about here in a second. 
Um, otherwise, so if it's not the goal state, then we want to take every successor of that element that we just removed from the data container. If that successor has already been visited, we want to ignore it. Otherwise, we want to record, oops, I don't know what's going on there. We want to record um, the parent successor relationship. So say that this successor, we need to, we need to record essentially somewhere, memoize the fact that this successor came from um, this element. And then we want to add that successor to the data container. Um, so we basically, in some sense, replace uh, the element that we removed with all of its children. Now, um, and that, I mentioned the parent successor relationship tracker here. So when we terminate, what we can do is we can move backwards from our goal node. And we can say, okay, our goal node, what was its parent? And then what was its parent? And then what was its parent? And so on and so forth. Um, until we get back to the start state, and then we kind of have our optimal path. Um, now, important, um, an important thing to note is that if by the time our data container is empty, we have never reached the goal state, um, then we can say with confidence that there is no valid path from the start state to the goal state. So we kind of have a disconnected graph. Fortunately, if we look at Tower of Hanoi, um, that's not possible because everything is connected to one another. There's always going to be a path from one node to another node. But in other games um, or puzzles, like for example, 8Puzzle, which is the project you'll be implementing, um, there is, um, uh, there's not necessarily a, uh, um, always going to be a path between a start, the start state and the, the goal state. Now, an important thing that I didn't talk about was this data container. Um, I kind of left that ambiguous, and that's on purpose because the choice of what data container of what data container we use and how the elements in that data container are ordered um, determine what the traversal strategy is. And in this course, we talk about kind of four main um, traversal strategies. Uh, and here are their their corresponding data containers. So if we just utilize as this data container a stack, we get our depth first search. If we utilize a queue, we get our breadth first search. If we use utilize a priority queue um, ordered by the g of n function, we get uniform cost search. If we utilize a priority queue or, ordered by um, g of n plus h of n, we get the a star search, which is kind of the, the gold standard that we're aiming for by the end of this. Um, so that g of n function is just the distance between a state n and the start state, and h of n is the estimated distance between a state n and the goal state. Um, so those are kind of two important functions. I'm sure you've already seen them before, but just as a quick reminder. Um, now, an important note uh, for a star is that h of n must be consistent for the general traversal algorithm to work. Um, there's some resources about you know, reminders on what a consistent heuristic is and what it looks like. Um, but, uh, and I'm sure you guys have talked a little bit about it in the course, but this is extremely important. Your, your algorithm will, will not be, um, correct unless you do have, um, a consistent heuristic. It's not enough just to be admissible. So, uh, without further ado, let's take a look at some of the starting code for this project. Um, and we're going to go through and implement all four of these, um, of these traversal strategies. So uh, I sh you should have a link to um, a repository that contains the three files, board.py, driver.py, and priorityq.py. Um, the two kind of main ones are, are the board and the driver. The priority queue is more of a library um, uh, file that we give you just for your convenience. Um, we've already filled out actually everything in the board.py, um, so we've kind of given you the data representation, so you don't really have to think about how to represent um, these uh, these these nodes in memory. We've already done it for you. Um, we want to focus more, or we want to utilize your time to focus more on the uh, the search algorithms themselves. So. If we come and take a look at our board, though, let's let's get you know familiar with some of the stuff that's going on here. Um, I'm actually not going to talk a whole lot about the underlying data representation. You can take a look at it. Um, there's some pretty verbose comments here that kind of walk you through everything. Um, I just want to show you some of the things that you will be using um, or that you'll need to use in order to do um, the the search algorithm. Um, so the first one is uh, is the hash function. Um, so if you have a, um, a game 
board object, right, that represents a particular game state, um, so that Python object, it's going to be, you know, stored at some place in memory. It's going to have, you know, data members and functions and all of that sort of stuff. Um, but we actually can't utilize um, the board object itself as a key in a Python dictionary. Um, it won't let you use mutable keys. Um, and if you don't know what that means, not, not super important, um, but what, what you need to take away from it is if you want to have a key for a dictionary in Python, it's got to be something like an integer. And so what the hash function does is it just takes the complicated sort of memory representation of a, of a Tower of Hanoi um, game board or game state and transforms it into a unique integer um, that we can then use to um, index a dictionary by. Uh, additionally, we provide the successors function. Um, so given a particular uh, uh, game state, what we can do is we can get all of the um, neighboring game state, the, the children game states, if you will. So if we take a look back at our game graph here, if I had you know this game state as a Python object, the successors function the successors function would generate um, a list containing this game state, this game state, and that game state right there. Um, additionally, it's actually going to um, give you the move that was used to um, to transition from this game state um, to another game state. Uh, so for example, it'll, it'll, you'll, this, this function will return a list that looks like this. So if there are n children, you know, the, the zeroth index will contain um, the new game board um, as well as the move needed um, to, con or to, to get to that game board from, from this game board, um, if that makes sense. Now, the move uh, is actually a tuple in itself, um, and there's a definition up here. So a move is just a um, what disk are we moving from what rod to what rod. Uh, so it should just be three a three integer thing. So if we're moving the fifth largest disk, or I mean, uh, yeah, the fifth largest disk, uh, what rod are we moving it from, and then where are we putting it next? Not super important. Um, uh, it's, it's really only if you want to get a, kind of a deep understanding of how we've implemented this here. Um, and you're welcome to change kind of the way we've done this here. Um, it's probably not the most optimal in terms of performance, um, more of a demonstration of, of, of how things could work or how you could represent um, a game if you wanted to. Now the final thing that we have um, is this uh, heuristic function. So if we look back at our um, at our data container choices here, we do have to have this, um, the estimated distance between a state n and its goal state in order to do the A star search. So when we come to do that, um, what the heuristic function does um, is provide that kind of estimated distance. So um, the heuristic function is that we provided is uh, consistent, so it meets the requirement that we've set out. Um, and uh, not super important to understand kind of how it works. Um, it's obviously uh, important for you to understand how it would work if you were to implement this yourself, right? This is the, developing the heuristics is actually kind of a big component of, of building an efficient um, A star algorithm when we get to there. I'll explain a little bit more. Um, and that's really kind of all you need to know. Uh, there's a couple utility functions down here that will generate, you know, a board, so a randomly shuffled board, a, um, you know, a board from a hash. So, you know, we had that function that um, gives you an integer representation of the Python object. This will construct the Python object from an integer representation. Um, you can play around with it if you want. I'm not going to, you know, waste the video time by diving too deep into it. Um, I now want to move on to this driver.py file here and show you kind of what we're working with here. Uh, so all of our search kind of algorithms are going to be represented or represented as subclasses of this search class. So this search class has some general functionality um, that every um, every one of the searches will need to use. So this unwind path algorithm um, actually uh, will um, well actually maybe I'll start here. Uh, this uh, this parent trace object um, is going to be the object where we store the, um, if we come back and look here, our parent successor relationships. 
Um, so recording what or how or what was the parent of every single um, board, where did it come from? And if we uh, look at the unwind path, uh, I mean, I'm not going to go through the logic of here, but essentially what it does is it uh, will uh, work backwards from the goal state to the to the start state and give you kind of the the optimal shortest distance path between the two, um, which then is used by this print path to give you kind of a graphical representation of the um, uh, of the, the the shortest path. Um, we've also gone ahead and implemented DFS search already for you in your starter code. Um, this is Hopefully it'll be used as an example of how some of these um, uh, top level functions work. Here, notice that DFS search inherits the, the search object um, and then implements the search method. Uh, I'll get back to talking about this here in a second. Let's see here. Uh, the last thing, uh, we've, we've given you kind of interfaces for the other search um, methods uh, as well as initialization of the different data members that you will that you'll need um, and we're going to walk through the implementation so you'll see how this all works here in a second um, I think actually this can go away we don't need that anymore um, but then what we do have is is this down here so hopefully by the end of it uh, we will be able to create kind of a random board with five disks and uh, on three pegs, um, and we're or sorry uh, with five pegs and three disks, and we're trying to move everything to the the last peg, and we can show you how to um, or what the path would be using DFS search, BFS search, the uniform cost search, and the A star search. So let's take a look at our DFS search here. So um, if we go back to our algorithm, um, let's let's see what's happening here. Um, so first things first, we want to load our um, our our initial data container with the start state. So if we come here, we can see that. So our data container for DFS search, um, as just a quick reminder, is going to be that stack. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to set our stack with this, this start state. Um, we're going to define state as being a, um, a both a game node here um, as well as the, um, uh, the move needed to get to the game node. I, actually, I think this is the hash. Um, so this isn't actually a Python object. Um, and this is the move we used to get to this hash. So whatever move from its parent um, we, we, we did. Um, since this is the start, there's really no move, so we'll just put everything as zero. So now we've got our while loop. So we're saying while that stack isn't empty, we're going to go ahead and pop off the first element of the, of the stack. We're going to get the... Um, Oh, sorry guys, it looks like I, I misspoke. Um, we definitely are, this is definitely a, a Python object. Because um, if you look down here, what we're doing is we're popping off the um, the first, or the, the end of that list. Um, we're getting the, the zeroth element, um, which is going to be that game board. And then we're going to call our hash function to get the hash of that game. So then we're going to check to see um, if it's finished. So if we come back here, we're going to say, Okay, is it the goal state? If it's the goal state, then we're going to terminate. Um, in this case, we're going to unwind that path, and that's that kind of optional unwind the parent successor relationship. And then we're going to return and finish. Um, so if it's not the goal state, so if the game isn't finished, um, then we are going to have this. Um, we're going to get the successors of that game. So these are all kind of the, the quote unquote children. Um, then we're going to filter out the games that we've already seen. Um, so parent trace, remember, is where we're, stare, we're is where we're storing the parent-child relationships. Um, and so, if we've already seen something, then it's going to be an index of a parent or in the, an index. Um, it's going to be a key value in the parent-child relationship. Uh, so there's no need to to you know further evaluate it. Uh, so then we're going to say for every successor. In the successors, we're going to record the parent-child relationship, and then we're going to put that successor 
onto, um, onto our stack. And that, that's essentially all that this is doing. So um, if we take a look you know, one more time at this, this is doing ex exactly what we, what we laid out here. Um, we've got our data container with our start state. We're removing the next element. We're saying if it's the goal state, terminate. Um, you know, and additionally, we're, we're unwinding. Um, and then for every successor, we're you know, filtering out the ones we've already visited, so we're ignoring them. Otherwise, we're recording that parent successor relationship and adding the successor to, the, um, to, that, to that data container. And in this case, since we're doing a depth first search, that data container is a stack. Notice that we don't, we don't have this number three thing implemented here because um, there's, there's no need to since Tower of Hanoi um, has a fully connected game graph as we talked about earlier. So, um, if we wanted to implement the um, BFS search, we could, you know, go and start from scratch and do all that um, again. But what I'm going to propose is actually something much simpler. Hopefully, um, since you know the algorithm, that general algorithm remains the same, we can we can literally just copy this um, and uh, down into here. So we can take this. And we can put this in here. And now we just have to figure out kind of what parts we have to swap out. And if we remember, really there's only kind of one thing that changes between the different algorithms, and that's that, that data container. So instead of using a stack, what we're going to do instead is use a queue. Um, so if I come to here and I do, uh, we've, we've actually gone up ahead and uh, maybe I haven't given it to you. Um, hold on, these uh, these are not looking right to me. So let me. We also want to import um, the uh, the Q Python library, so that gives us the the Q data structure. Um, and then. We're at the BFS search. So we came down here. So I'm going to make a new queue. So I'm just going to say queue is equal to, um, if I remember, it is equal to Q dot Q. So we create a new queue there. And instead of doing that, what we're going to do is um, Q dot put. So this is store something in the queue. Um, we're going to just keep everything else to be the exact same. Um, and are these all lining up? Let's make sure they are. There we go. Those are all lining up. So now instead of popping, um, we just do the get. And that's, oh, no, hold on. I need to just replace uh, the queue one more time. I don't think we have any other stacks around here, not that I'm seeing at least. So now our BFS search should work um, just fine. So it was, it was literally that easy um, when switching between a BFS and a DFS search. Um, so let me give you an example. Um, let's do kind of a, a, a live demo here of the uh, algorithm. So I'm going to open up a terminal. Uh, I know you can't see this yet, so bear with me. I'm going to find where I put it, desktop, Hanoi Tower, Hanoi Tower, and fingers crossed that this works with no errors, Python 3, driver.py, and we get a little error, it says stack is not defined. Um, and you guys are probably watching this and know exactly where the error is. And here it is. So what I want to do instead of that is not q.mp. So yep, you got to be careful and catch all of those, um, those stacks. But here, if we do it one more time, am I missing it? Didn't, didn't I? Didn't I? Oh, maybe I did. Q dot get instead. Okay, there we go. So if we look here, 
we have our DFS search, um, our first thing. So here's our original board here. Um, you don't have to remind the, the heuristic stuff yet. That's more of some output for our A star. Um, but if you want to know, it's saying that our best guess currently is that we're two away um, from the goal at this point. Uh, but actually, we are 25 away, um, according to DFS search. Uh, and here's the steps that DFS used to solve the um, to solve the problem. And then here's our BFS search. So much better in terms of giving us the the um, the path. In fact, BFS search will always give you your optimum path. Um, and if you think about it, it should be pretty clear why. Um, and that's in stark contrast to DFS search, which doesn't do that at all. Um, so BFS search is kind of a good baseline. Um, our uniform cost search and our A star search are, do this, or, or are similar to the BFS in that they give you kind of the optimal path. Um, they should, you know, once we implement them, work much faster than BFS. But if you want to check things, the BFS is the way to go. Um, and if we just kind of sanity check this right now, it looks like it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. It moves this 2 onto the 3, and then it moves the 1 onto the 3, um, and there we go. And so we got, you know, obviously a stark dis difference between this, B this DFS and this BFS just by swapping out um, that stack, which we implemented using the built-in um, Python list, with the queue that we grabbed from the Python, um, the built-in Python queue library. And so that's really all the difference that, there, that you need to do there. Let's take a look at the uniform cost search. So now let's take a look at this uniform cost search. Uh, this is going to be a little bit more complicated in that um, if we take a look at our algorithm um, one more time, we've got to um, keep track of this distance between a state n and the start state in our, um, our g of n function, as well as utilize this priority q data structure. Um, so jumping back into the code, uh, we have this priority queue right here that we're going to be using. Um, I'll take you through the library here in a second. And we also want to keep kind of this memoized dictionary of, um, of boards mapped to their G-scores. Um, and the reason we do that is uh, so that we don't have to recompute a G-score every time. We can utilize the, uh, we can utilize kind of like a, um, a, you know, a quote-unquote database of G-scores. Um, we also have this closed set, so we are uh, segregating responsibilities between the parent trace and uh, the, uh, um, the concept of what we've already visited before. So um, in our previous algorithms, if you look up here, we kind of said, um, you know, the parent trace, if it's in the parent trace, we've already visited it. Um, for clarity's sake, because this is going to get a little bit more complicated, we're going to separate that out. Um, so let's, look, let, let's take a look at the priority queue. Um, if you've been through uh, C343, you're probably familiar with either priority queues or heaps. They're one and the same. Essentially, they keep you know, an efficient ordering of their elements um, in, in not necessarily a FIFO or LIFO um, order. Uh, so the important methods are this update. So this puts a game into the queue with a given priority, or it'll update a game that's already in the queue with a new priority. It's kind of an overloaded method. We have this pop, which is going to give us our next game. Um, so you know, in other words, it's going to re re return the lowest priority game in the queue. Finally, we have is empty, which we're going to call repeatedly in our while loop to determine whether uh, the queue is empty. I, I, we've named them open set and closed set because that's the canonical naming um, for uniform cost search. Uh, you can think of this as these are the open set contains the games that are uh, we haven't explored their children yet, so they're kind of still sitting sitting in that data structure. That's the intermediate data structure that we reference in this, or the intermediate data container that we reference in the general pathfinding algorithm. Uh, the closed set is is literally just kind of a set, so. It's what if we are, what if, what it's, it, this this contains all the nodes for which we've already expanded um, and and um, examined their children. So that should be all kind of fairly clear. Um, unfortunately, there, there's enough differences here with the data structures that we're using and the approach that we're going to take to them uh, that I'm not just going to copy and paste the the DFS search. Um, although by the end of it, by the end of writing this, we're going to it's going to look very similar. Um, I do want to walk through this one step by step. 
Um, so the first thing to notice is that we've already put the start state in our uh, our data container. Um, so we, we don't really have a need to do that um, here. Instead, we can start out with our while loop directly. So I'm just going to say while not um, our, our data container, while it's not empty, we're going to do some stuff. Uh, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to pop out the, um, the next element. So this gets the next element and removes it from the, uh, the data container. I'm also going to kind of memoize the um, hash of that game board. I'm going to save that. The next thing that we do, um, if we remember, is to check to see if, we're, if, we, if that is the goal state. So are we finished? If we're finished, we're going to unwind that parent-child relationship um, mapping, and we can exit our search function. Otherwise, we need to get all of the successors. So we do current.successors. Now, this is where we start to differ a little bit. Um, if we uh, we want to keep track of the the um, the nodes that we've already uh, gotten the successors for, and we want to say that we've already you know we've already visited them, and and before we kind of just had that implicit thing in our parent trace um, for the uh, uniform cost search and for the A star search next, what we're going to utilize is this close set like I already mentioned. So let's put it in our close set. So we're going to say self dot close set. Um, if you remember what I was talking about earlier in the video, we've got to index it by the hash, um, and we want to say, okay, it's in our close set. So the next thing that we want to do is we want to iterate over all of our, for the successor and our successors, we want to iterate over all of them. Um, let's memoize its hash, so we get the s hash is successors. Um, now remember that su every successor is not just a game board. Um, it's a tuple containing a game board and the move that we did to get to that game board. Um, the first element in the tuple is the game board itself, so I'm going to get that first element and I'm going to get its hash. There we go. Okay. Um, first thing that we're going to do is we're going to see if we've already visited this um, this successor. And if we'd already visited it, it would have been in the closed set. So we say if this board is in the closed set, then we want to continue. Um, continue just means we want to, you know, go to the next successor. So ignore everything that comes after after this. The next thing that we want to do is we want to get the uh, the G score for this successor. I'm going to call it the temp G score, and we'll see why I do that in a second. So I'm going to say temp G score equals self dot um, G score, and it's actually going to be one plus the parent because you can think of it. Tower of Hanoi, every move is weighted at one. I mean, really, in any, in any puzzle that we're going to be working with, at least in this course, you know, every move is going to be weighted one. So this is one, one further away than its parent, um, and its parent is the current, the current um, board up here. So we're going to say it's one further away than its parent. So that's its G score, or at least its temporary G score. And then we're going to have um, this if statement here. So if the uh, uh, if we have not visited this node before, um, and by visited I mean not that we've expanded this node, because if we had already expanded the node, it would have been in the closed set and we would have continued. I mean if we had gotten to this node from another um, from another parent. Um, and by this node, I mean the successor node. Um, then it, it's possible that there's already a G score assigned to the successor, and we only want to really consider this this successor as a as a new viable shortest path um, if the G score is less than its previous G score. So we kind of have a couple of, of cases to consider. So the first case is what if we you know this is the first time we've really ever seen this node. So that would mean that this successor is not currently in our mapping of g-scores, so self.g-scores. So if it's not in there, then we can safely say that we can replace you know, whatever is at that index for oops, s hash, 
with that temp key score. Um, otherwise, it's def it, it, it must be in there. And let's check to see if our our you know temp key score if it's greater than or equal to what's already in there. Um, S then we actually don't even want to consider the successor as a viable successor. Because if it's further away from the start, then, um, or if, if this kind of path that we're examining um, results in this successor, this particular node, being further away than when we saw this successor from another path, then this is definitely not going to be the, vi the most viable, you know, shortest path. So we're going to continue again. We're going to skip everything that comes after this. We're not going to save it. We're going to say, okay, we're going to terminate, terminate early. Um, otherwise, it's in the, the G-score thing, but we must have come across a shorter path than what we'd seen before. Um, so we're just going to overwrite what was in there um, before with this... Uh, oops. With this new um, uh, this new value, so temp g score. Yep. So that's what we're gonna do there. Uh, and now we want to do our so that that's 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 all the saving of the um, saving of the g scores. And then we can kind of return to what we had earlier in our DFS and BFS implementation, which is saving the uh, the parent successor relationship. So parent trace. S hash equals our C hash or the parent, um, and then we want to also save the move that uh, that that connects these two, um, the S hash and the C hash. Um, you know, again, you can you know you're more than welcome to reference those top level functions if you want help understanding about why we do it or you know what its purpose is. Um, and, and you know, I would encourage you to even emulate some of the behavior that we've implemented here for your uh, for your your assignment. Um, that'll require you to obviously understand what we're doing. But you know, for this video, not not super important. Just important to see that we're recording that relationship. Um, and then we want to update our open set, right? So add the successor to the um, uh, to the, the data container. Um, and then, you know, it's important, we're, we're setting, we're ordering it by the G-score. Um, so if we come back to our algorithm, um, uh, we want to add the successor to the data container, and we want to order it by that G of N. So that's, that's what we're doing with, on, that, on that particular line. Um, so with this, um, that should be really all we need to do here. Um, again, we don't need to implement this this part three because everything's connected. Um, so if I we cross our fingers and come back to our terminal here, um, we should now get uh, our uniform cost search to work. So let's see. Uh oh, we've got an error, and it's probably me just making some typos. Um, so there are two C's in successor, at least the way that I'm choosing to spell it here. So, got that. And I probably did this all over the place. In fact, let me just, let me just find all of these. Um, so that's there, that's there. Let me do it there. Okay. There we go. So... Um, if we take a look at this, so remember what I said earlier, the BFS search is kind of, that's the, that's the baseline that we want to compare everything to. Um, so if we look at this, here are the moves that it made, and they look the same as the uniform cost search. So that's how we know that we've done it properly, um, and all's good there. Now, we can do even better than the uniform cost search with the A star search, and we can do that in... Um, in much the same way that we do the uniform cost search, um, except all, or except we need, or uh, uh, sorry, except we can um, uh, uh, instead of having this G score as the ordering, we just have the G score plus um, the the heuristic um, that H of n value. Uh, so it's, in fact, it's so similar, I think we can do the same thing we did with the BFS and the DFS and just copy our implementation down into 
into here. Um, I think some of these uh, these things are a little bit old, um, so I'm going to go ahead and change some things. It should be updated in the, in the code that we hand you as your starter. So now this is looking pretty similar between the two uh, starting things. So I'm going to copy in this search mechanism and throw it down here. And that's all lining up. That's looking good. Um, so if we come down to this um, this update method, really this is just a, a, a one line change. Now instead of putting the G score in um, alone, we're going to do the successors board and we're going to call the heuristic. I think I'm spelling that right. The heuristic function. And that, that should give it that should um, get us to where we need to go to do a star. So um, let's let's take a look. Tuple object. Oh, yeah, because I still can't spell successors. Or successor. And I I think I messed it up up here too. I think that's why my auto corrector is just throwing things off. Okay, so here's our A star search. There we go. So it should be the same as the, the uniform cost. It looks like it's the same to me. It should be the same as the BFS. And it should be much, much better than the DFS, which you can see is horrendous. Now, you might be wondering, okay, so why do we do all of this? Um, you know, why do we have three separate implementations? If BFS was giving us the same answer at the very beginning, and the answer is that this, this A star, or I guess that uniform cost um, is more efficient than BFS, um, and then A star is more efficient than uniform cost. Uh, so, you know, that's the implementation stuff. I'm going to do a quick demo of the timing um, here in a sec, but I'm going to have to pause the video because I didn't pre-build it in advance. Um, but uh, if you're not interested in that, 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 that's all you need to know. Everything that comes after this will just be kind of extra, extra content um, uh, for those of you guys who are interested. Okay, so I've gone ahead and added some timing functionality uh, to this starter file. Um, so I'll actually, you know, update the starter file that I include in the repository. Um, you can see I'm importing the time library there, and then down in the printing, I'm starting kind of, you know, recording the start time, and then I'm printing out the end time minus the start time, and that should be the number of seconds it takes um, to complete each um, each search traversal or, or pathfinding algorithm. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, let's run it one more time. So if we come up here, okay. Uh, so we're seeing, you know, A star blisteringly fast, y uniform cost, you know, still very fast, all these very fast, DFS uh, is fast, not not really much difference here. Uh, let's try to increase the, the size of um, the search space that we're working on. Um, so I'm going to move it from three different disks to seven disks. Uh, I'm going to run it one more time. So let's see what's going on here. Okay, so now we're taking some time. Okay, so the DFS search took 13,000 moves, got done in a second and a half. BFS took a while, got it done in 12 moves, but it took it 5.75 seconds. If we come up here, here's our here's our uniform cost search, right? Okay, so I guess let's let's come up and look at the results here. Um, so DFS, <laughs> super bad path, right? 13,000 you know moves to solve this. Um, but it uh it got it done in one one and a half seconds. Our BFS search was able to to give us a path of twelve second or of twelve moves, um, but at the trade off that it took you know three or four times as long um, in order to to give us that that optimal solution. Um, uniform cost search still gives us the the twelve move solution here. Um, it actually takes a little bit longer, I guess, in, in Python. Um, so if you remember how we implemented uniform cost, we, we put in some extra data structures and whatnot. Um, and I think that the overhead of adding those in, in actually kind of um, uh, overshadowed any, any time 
uh, savings we got from a more efficient algorithm. You know, of course, we are implementing this in Java or C++. Um, I think you would see this uniform cost search thing being um, being much less than the breadth first search. Um, but just due to the inefficient nature of Python, that's, that's kind of what we got out. Um, but if we look at this A star search, so still, you know, 12, 12, uh, 12 move solution. We we get it done in in a fraction of a time. Um, this is really amazing because really all we did, if we, we come back and look at the code, um, is just add do this little plus heuristic. Um, so just a little bit of a better ordering, a little bit of a boost to the intelligence of the search, um, can give us a, a you know. This is over an, you know, almost two orders of math, almost a 50 times speed up in terms of you know how fast the program runs, and so that's why we want to graduate um, from you know the naive way to get the optimal path to the the smart way, um, getting us getting it for us much much faster. And so hopefully that's a that this demonstration um, just kind of as a whole shows you kind of the motivation behind why we. Uh, have these different pathfinding algorithms, as well as some guidance as to how the implementation of them might look. And um, hopefully you can use this to uh, uh, help you get through your, your upcoming assignment. Um, as always, if you've got any questions or anything about the course or about the assignment in general, feel, feel free to post on Piazza. Um, I'll include the starter code that we started with um, at the beginning of this video uh, on GitHub so that you guys can reference it and follow along if you want. Um, but don't feel obligated. As always, this is an optional kind of tutorial to help you along in case you ran into obstacles uh, implementing your eight puzzle assignment. So thanks for watching, um, and I hope it helped.